Good evening. I came here today to talk to you about the power that each and every one of you may hold in your hands during an epidemic to save thousands, if not millions, of lives. I've dedicated my career to preparing for epidemics. And at the FDA, I work with teams of scientists, researchers, doctors, and lawyers to speed development of drugs, vaccines, diagnostic tests, and medical products that can save lives during epidemics. Drug development is a highly collaborative undertaking involving many partners, manufacturers, researchers, regulators. But the most important partner in this collaborative enterprise is the patient who volunteers for clinical research designed to establish whether an unproven drug is safe and effective. Because the tragic Ebola epidemic is still so seared in my heart and in my mind, I'm going to use it to give you some information that you may need one day to make a powerful choice. Epidemics are highly disruptive events. Imagine for a minute that an epidemic broke out in your community and you could not take public transportation, you could not go to work, you could not go to school, you could not attend events like this because they were banned to prevent further spread of disease. If you're pregnant, imagine not being able to go to the hospital to safely deliver your child. And if you are a healthcare professional, imagine working in fear of contagion. An epidemic can tear apart the fabric of our society. And Ebola in particular is a cruel disease because it spreads by direct contact. Patients, including children and babies, may die alone and untouched. And those who are lucky enough to survive often suffer lingering health effects like blindness and tremendous social stigma. To date, this epidemic has claimed more than 11,000 lives, has created more than 28,000 individual stories of pain and suffering and loss. 16,000 children in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea have lost one or both parents to this deadly virus. Extended families, villages have been decimated. When the epidemic hit West Africa, there were no proven treatments for Ebola. The U.S. government was developing several candidates, but most of these had never been tested in humans. The sooner we could show whether an unproven drug, unproven drug was safe and effective, the sooner we could use it to help patients. And the fastest way to find out would be to test it in patients with Ebola. But how could we do this safely, quickly, and get the evidence that we needed to figure out whether these unproven drugs would work or not. We knew from experience that this was no time to circle the wagons. We needed to move fast and go global. So let me ask you two questions. Imagine, again, that Ebola breaks out in your community and you are one of the few thousands of people who are infected with this virus. Now, there is an unproven drug available for testing at your two main hospitals. Let's say Hospital A and Hospital B. This unproven drug was given to 12 sick monkeys in the lab. They had Ebola, and they all lived. But this unproven drug was never given to humans before. Please raise your hand if you would like to take this drug, if you wish to take this drug. What if I told you that this drug could also make your Ebola worse? It could increase your chances of dying when you might otherwise survive. That it can hurt your kidneys, your lungs, your brain, damage that could not be predicted from the monkey studies. 
please raise your hand if you still want to take this drug. Well, it's generally agreed that we need to do clinical studies in humans to find out, because right now we simply do not know whether this unproven drug will help, will hurt, or will do nothing. But the doctors and investigators at the two hospitals are arguing about the best way to do that. And this drug is, by the way, available in limited supply. In Hospital A, doctors want to test this drug by giving it on a first-come, first-served basis to every new patient with Ebola. And they'll carefully record the outcomes, whether they live or die, and they'll compare these outcomes to what happened to all the other patients with Ebola in the preceding months, before this test drug was available for testing. This type of design is called a historically controlled trial. In Hospital B, doctors argue that the best way to test this drug is by providing the best medical care to every new patient and randomly assigning some patients to also receive the test drug. So at this hospital, some of you will not get the test drug. And they'll compare the outcomes between the patients who receive the test drug and the patients who don't. And this type of design is called a randomized controlled clinical trial. So those of you who would go to A, please raise your hand. And those of you who go to B, please raise your hand. Well, the rational Mr. Spock from Star Trek would also pick Hospital B in a heartbeat. But we humans have a very difficult time with the idea that when we're faced with a serious illness, that we may not get a test drug that could potentially help. And that's very understandable. Even if we have very little, informa very little information about a test drug, it's in our nature to want to give it a try, hoping that it will help and often not considering the potential harm. Our brain tends to downplay the unknown risks of the drug and exaggerate the potential benefit to relieve suffering and save lives. In times of fear, in times of stress, fear tends to prevail over logic. But this very understandable human reaction is not in our best individual or common interest. And that's because most drugs that enter human clinical trials are not shown to be safe and effective. Even those that appear to be very promising at first. Think about it, who would test a drug in a clinical trial if they did not think that the drug was promising, right? But fact is that about nine out of 10 drugs that enter development fail. They fail because they're either harmful or because they don't work. And patients depend on us to study new medical products carefully and properly so we can get to the right answer, so we can know whether they really work or not. And that's why clinical trials are so important. But to get to the right answers, we need to choose the right clinical trial design. And choosing the right clinical trial design is crucial to more than the patients who are enrolled in a trial. Understanding whether a drug actually works and its overall contribution to patient care matters to every patient with the disease, now and well into the future. One of the most important parts of a well-designed clinical trial is the ability to make valid comparisons, to compare apples to apples. So the test group and the control group should be the same in every way except for receiving the test drug. In a randomized controlled clinical trial, patients are either assigned to a group that receives a test drug or to a control group that does not. But everyone is cared for in the same way so that we can com compare apples to apples. And any differences in their outcome, for better or for worse, should be the result of the test drug. In a historically controlled trial, 
the outcomes of patients in the trial are compared to the outcomes of patients outside the trial, patients that came before them. So we may not be comparing apples to apples. And to be fair, this type of design may work very well for diseases where we have a very predictable course and outcome. For example, with rabies, where almost everyone dies, or certain types of cancers that progress, steadily progress towards death. But in the case of Ebola, the outcomes vary dramatically from center to center, country to country, and over time. Death ranged from less than 40% to more than 80%. And the reasons for these differences could not be readily explained. In any situation involving a new or emergent infectious diseases, it's very difficult to establish comparative comparable groups in a historically controlled trial. And one reason is because it takes a while for us to figure out the disease. It takes a while for us to figure out how to care for patients with the disease. And in many instances, it takes time also to build the capacity to care for patients properly. So if patients today are receiving better medical care than patients who came before them, the two groups are not truly comparable. And they may do better today for reasons that have nothing to do with the test drug. If the two groups are not truly comparable, the key risk with this type of trial design is that we conclude that a drug works when it doesn't. And we can also conclude that a drug is safe when it's actually harmful. And worse of all, because we don't even know that we have reached false conclusions, the harm is perpetuated well into the future. Well, it turns out that the question I posed to you about the hospital, what is the best way to figure out whether a drug works or not, is not a hypothetical one. This very question was fiercely debated during the Ebola epidemic. Scientists, researchers, philanthropists, ethicists, nonprofits, and the World Health Organization argued the issue, and the debate is still going on. Some experts were strongly opposed to a clinical trial where some patients, by random chance, would not receive a test drug. Ebola is such a horrible disease, they said, it would be wrong to withhold a test drug from these patients if this test drug could potentially help, even if it could cause more harm than good. And they also said that the affected populations in West Africa would not accept randomization. And I'll get back to th this question in a minute. So for these reasons, some researchers chose to conduct historically controlled trials where every patient receives a test drug, despite the limited ability of these trials to give us valid conclusions. And these trials did not teach us what we really needed to know to help us care for patients with Ebola. But there's a hopeful side to the story. A group of researchers in the US and West Africa teamed up to establish a randomized controlled clinical trial to, to study Ebola therapeutics. This trial was established in the US, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, and in Guinea. It was one trial in four countries. The first patient to enroll in this trial, which was designed to enroll all kinds of patients, including pregnant women and children, but the very first patient to enroll was an American clinician working in Sierra Leone when he contracted Ebola and was brought back to the US for medical treatment at the National Institutes of Health. He was extremely sick. And he was given the choice to participate in a randomized controlled clinical trial. If he had chosen not to participate, he would still have received the best possible medical care that we knew how to give. But fortunately, this clinician chose to enroll in this trial. And since then, many others have enrolled in this study. Put into rest once and for all the myth that the affected populations in West Africa would not accept randomization. These patients are heroes in my book, but they're no different than you or me. 
And because of their decisions, the information that we're learning from this trial, which is still ongoing, is going to teach us a lot about how to care for patients with Ebola properly. So looking back, the Ebola epidemic brought home a number of chilling facts. New diseases will continue to emerge. This is our new normal. It's not possible to predict when or where they will strike. But when they do, they can spread very rapidly from one region to the next. And there will be tremendous pressure and tremendous desire to give unproven drugs to patients who are so sick. Some of you may recall that we faced similar pressures when the AIDS epidemic emerged in the 1980s. Back then, randomized controlled clinical trials generated the information that transformed the way my fellow physicians and I care for our patients with HIV. This information changed, transformed HIV from a death sentence into a chronic illness where most of our patients today live long and healthy lives. And each and every one of those patients who enrolled in clinical trials to test HIV drugs have since contributed to saving millions of lives globally. So let's not compound the tragedy of an epidemic by reaching its end and not learning what actually can help patients. For the greater good, let's uphold the tried and true scientific principles. Even during epidemics, and especially in times of fear, they have driven the development of so many life-saving therapies in our times. These tried and true scientific principles will give us the information that we need to make sound decisions and to save lives. Now that you know the story, where we all may have a role to play, what will you do? I hope, like me, you choose to embrace your inner Mrs. Spock and not let fear prevail over logic. And in doing so, we'll join the scores of other heroes helping to save thousands, if not millions, of lives. Thank you. Thank you.